I'm Catherine Goldman Schuyler, and this is Exploring Leadership. I'm delighted to be talking today with Alonzo King, founder of Lines Ballet, an internationally respected company based in San Francisco for the past 35 years. He is not only a great choreographer, but encourages his dancers to find their own voice, both in movement and words. I wanted to interview you, not only because I love your choreography, but also because of the unique approach in the way that you work with your dancers, and I want to learn more about the way you lead lines and have built a company. Because I'm very aware that in addition to being an amazing performing group that tours around the world. Lines Ballet has education programs that go into schools for all ages of children, that uh, you have a summer training program for young dancers to help them really transform, I think, the, the where they're coming from and yes. what they can do, and a unique university degree program in dance. A Dominican. Yeah. So, and I believe I read that you've supported over a million students so far, and that over a third of the graduates of the formal program become choreographers yes. in, their, in their own right, which seems pretty powerful as a statement. So you're not only a choreographer, but a founder and leader of a large organization that influences many people's lives. Your approach to dance has been described as Alonzo King has been called a visionary choreographer who's altering the way we look at ballet. King calls his works thought structures created by the manipulation of energies that exist in matter through laws which govern the shapes and movement directions of everything that exists. So I'd love to understand that better. (laughs) And beyond that, I know that invitations to support LINE say that the performances and education programs, and I love this part, cultivate empathy, independent thinking, and fearless exploration. Yes. That's why we're here today. (laughs) I was thinking about leadership and... Most of us have it wrong. Leadership, if you look at real leaders, great leaders, it's service. It is about service to a cause, to humanity. It is keeping the goal in front of you. And what does that mean? It means, again that people are looking at who you are and what your consciousness is. It's the same with dancers. Dancers are leaders. We're looking at dancers on stage. And the brilliant ones are telling us how life can be lived with this much honesty, with this much depth, with this much humility, with this much precision, with this much surrender. And so it's human, it's the, the, the pinnacle of human qualities that devastate and inspire us. It can obliterate us because we realize, oh my God, I used to do that, but I stopped. I, my heart used to be more open, but as I aged, it hardened and closed. And so looking at dancers on stage, reading novels, looking at paintings, hearing music, they awaken the sleeping, hardened inner self to say, wake up, remember, remember? And that if these individuals have this, so do you, because you too are human and our possibilities are unlimited. That is the point of great works of art to slap you with aesthetic shock so that you wake up and remember, I am not a weak whining mortal. I have unlimited possibilities. That's the whole point.
How did you go from having an idea that you'd like to start <coughs> a group mm -hmm. to having not only this amazing group that seems to renew itself because you the standard stays the same with new performers, but also the school and the school programs? What led you to, and how did you do that? Well, when we began Lines... Part of our mission was a collective and that we wanted to educate and we wanted to share. And so we understood that for a real success, you have to include others. You have to bring in the community and you have to share. It can't just be your little plot of soil with us four no more, like the small family unit. No, we knew that this had to be distributed and for everyone. Um, and so it really began with me teaching tons of classes and talking about the meaning of things. Your thinking is infused through all of the programs, right? From the yes, little children. Absolutely. Through the university degree. Absolutely. How does that happen? I, or I know that organizations don't run themselves. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, they're not that easy. Well, one of the unique things about Lines is that there are many of the former dancers who are, who have become teachers. Marina Hotchkiss is with the BFA program. Um, the founders, Pamela Jane Hagen, Robert Rosenwasser, they're still here working, who were the two, who my two partners, who 36 years ago said, let's start a company. Um, but I think that the, one of the foundations <clears throat> is we actually do believe in human beings. We believe in human beings and the potential that lies within human beings. We believe in that. We don't just say it, we believe in it. And we see that transformation through the work of concentration, through the work of dedication. And that is um, a beautiful thing to witness, to see someone bloom to see someone become large, to see someone change. It's a beautiful thing to witness and to encourage, to stimulate. So when you're creating a new ballet, yes, which you do regularly, that's true. Uh, I heard you saying in a video that you have a vision or a plan, and I also have seen you work with dancers and see how you bring it from deep inside of them and ask them to think and be fully present. Yes. How do you do that, the both of those, the having the vision, the leadership role, and also really trusting them? I think it's, that's a lot of things. Um, first of all, it's who you hire. <laughs> you want to work with incredible artists. And part of that means that <clears throat> you're working with incredible human beings, people where there's a willingness, people who have their own genius and their own point of view, but they're willing to let it go for a bigger idea so that you use both. There has to be a place where 
the artists, just like composers or the other people who come in to contribute to a, a creation, they want to transform themselves. And that usually means that they're trying to eradicate some stain of previous training that has them locked. Sometimes a person is so trained, so overly trained, that they have no more choices. It is all decisions that were planted in them. Some, I would say so often style mm -hmm. or ways of doing things <clears throat> that has eradicated the creative process. There was a period in dancing where people were trained to just be physically facile and that a choreographer would fill you up with ideas. This was predominantly in classical dance. This was not the case in modern because from the very beginning, there was a thinking ethic. There was a, a, an ideational cause. But, for, but for, in classical training, for so many years, it was just about the approximation of form. If I'm looking for dancers or artists to work with, I'm looking for people who are interested in not only a contribution, but they're also interested in transformation. Because in a relationship, in any relationship, there comes a point with maturity where you realize a relationship is about self-reform. That's the whole point. It's about, it's about a reflection that I'm seeing in someone else, be it my God, be it nature, be it my profession, discipline, partner, whatever it is, that is showing me where I, that is teaching me to expand. <clears throat> it's showing my shortcomings. It's showing my limitations. It's showing, it's exposing my likes and dislikes, which are a problem because it's children's stuff. And how to get beyond those. And so the word for me is expansion. In all of our relationships <clears throat> and everyone that's set up, there is the place where the honeymoon is over and real work begins. And that is the call of self-reform. And what does it mean? It means that most of us begin with the idea of me, 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 me. And with more expansion, it becomes we. But then, we is not enough. It has to eventually become one. So from me to we to one. And in oneness, there are no strangers. There's no separation between any of the kingdoms, human, plant, animal, you know, or what seems inert to a lot of folks. If I see a mountain and I feel no separation from that mountain, I'm not going to de destroy it and exploit it for its mineral values that are going to affect the planet <clears throat> by the, the destruction of this mountain. I revere it because that mountain is me. That's oneness, where there's no separation. You ask, how do we find that in dancers? Plainly put, selflessness less self and that is part of the training the ego really has us by the throat <clears throat> and the objective is to release that grip on the throat and find how to dissolve into your larger self when does that happen the moment we have compassion the moment we see a situation and go oh my god 
We've witnessed something suffering, and what did we drop? We dropped the idea of me. All of a sudden, it opened up. Except there's still a little stain, because even when you want to eradicate suffering, you want to eradicate it because it's causing you pain to witness it. And so this, <clears throat> this what we were just talking about, the me, we, one, how do we get to expand the me to the we, to the we, to the one? It's the release of selfishness. It's the release of the identification <clears throat> of the teeny little minuscule body as you, as yourself. And yet the dancers, I mean, I train, I think, all the time practically and can move in ways that most human beings can't even imagine a human body moving, let alone their own. How do you combine those? Or it's not combined, they're already <laughs> there, I know, from the inside, but how do you bring that out? The dancers, in training, the physical body is the most minimal of training. What you're training is the mind and the heart. The physical body is daily repetition with what? People can be daydreaming and doing it. Things won't work. And so what you are tuning is the mind so that it is expansive, that it is creative and feels the position of the mind feels that I have the ability to do anything. That's a beautiful place. That's a creative place. And the heart wants to expand its magnanimity. <clears throat> so let's say we think of our kindness to people. Not to get a return, but to have it pouring from us. Kindness. If we think of that in terms of steps and shapes, steps and shapes are ideas. And often you'll hear dancers say, oh, I don't like this step or I don't like that. No, you get to a place where you honor all of them. Isn't that wonderful? And so it's not like you're a certain way with this person and a certain way with that person. In, sh in the world of making shapes, <clears throat> you honor each and every one with, 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 with high regard. And so back to the uh, reform again and expansion, you're not thinking about what you're getting. You want to give. Years ago, I heard a man speak about giving, and he said there's three kinds. There's the person who gives, <clears throat> and they never let you forget that they gave. Then there's the person who gives, and they don't say anything to you, but they never forget that they gave. And then there's the person who gives and they don't even know they're giving. It's just their way. It's the Johnny Appleseed way. You just give. And it takes a long time to work with all of your might, all of your diligence, all of your, your generosity and not be worried about reward and not be concerned with recognition. That is expansion. You're not, you're, not, you're not playing the banking model where you're looking for the return on your investment. Well, I gave in this much and uh, the return is not equal to what I gave in, so this isn't working for me. No. You just give. You're not thinking about the return. And the richness of that kind of life creates expansion inevitably. The banking model has crippled us because this idea of the equity of return, no, 
giving is the return. And people who've tapped into that realize it feels good. It feels good to give. And it, cre it creates a circle where what is, what is needed is provided. We don't need so much as we think we do. But this is back to the specifics, the specifics of your question. How do you get the artist to expand? First of all, they have to want to. And so that goes back to how you choose the dancers and what you admire in human beings. And everyone has something that they admire in human beings. And everyone has something that they dislike in human beings. And often the things that we dislike, we have in ourselves. projects <clears throat> with big name composers and wonderful artists it's always so liberating to find people because the people who are really amazing in my experience they have humility and they want to create a work together they're not interested in showing themselves off where's my part well, I'm going to, no, they want to build something that has not existed before and that hopefully will exist long after we've left the body. And so to have that in the room and to have a lot of people with that as their goal, that we want to create something that hasn't been created and we want to <clears throat> give it to humanity and we want to chisel it with such depth and precision and truth that it outlives us and continues to emanate, continues to radiate, continues to communicate ideas to the world. is struggle you know from the salmon going back upstream to return to its beginnings that's all of us how do we you know the, the reality is paradise lost and how do we return to that <clears throat> how do we get away from the monkey mind how do we get away with from the carrot that we've all been educated in to chase after something external that is supposed to satisfy us and it doesn't work. Because we've been told that these external objectives are going to make you happy. That's the goal, why? Because every human being, all of us on planet Earth, Yogananda makes it very clear that we are, our commonality is that we want to avoid pain and suffering. And we want some kind of joy that never goes stale. And that makes all of our choices because we're thinking this is going to eliminate pain and suffering for me on every level. And that this is going to bring me some kind of joy that doesn't pale or doesn't <clears throat> sad, it, 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 it will keep me the elixir will keep me ever satisfied. And so that external searching is where it begins, you know, desire, my great enemy, <laughs> because it can't satisfy you. Matter cannot satisfy spirit. It doesn't work. And so 
in that same story that you hear encapsulated in so many fairy tales, the treasure is inside. Mm -hmm. And when the search becomes in reverse, not externally searching, but to go internally searching, which really is the final frontier, not outer space, but inner space. When that search begins, you're on your way home. You're back, you're, you're, you're headed back to wholeness. The, the three sufferings of mind, body, soul will begin to be eliminated. I do love about art making is that it is one of the paths that takes you internally instead of external. It is the one that requires you to be interiorized with contemplation and to give things thought on the ideational level of creation. You are interiorized for through depth of concentration and through a search that makes you forget about yourself. You haven't mentioned at all growing up black in the US <laughs> and I know you have at other times but has that affected the company that you've created and the world you've created here? And if so, in what ways? My father, Slater King, was a civil rights leader. He was the president of the Albany Movement in Albany, Georgia. And Martin Luther King came to assist in Albany. During that time, SNCC was at my house, well, at the, at the house of my dad, and CORE, and Martin Luther King. My father was very close with Malcolm X. There's letters that they exchanged that are at the Fisk University Library. And so I'm saying all this to say that my parents actually believe what they professed they lived in. And they were actually willing to die for the cause that they believed in. There was a whole community and that was their that was their their standing ground that we are willing to die. Can you imagine that is inspiring and incredibly Intimidating. He went to jail quite a bit for things he believed in. Um, he took my brother and me to march. You know, he was arrested. Police took us home. Uh, and I don't, you know, I, my point is that when you have, when you are in a community where everyone, where the majority is of one mind, and it's about making things better. It's about helping the world to evolve. That's what it's really about. Um, and all of these people are coming into that community from New York, from California, whether it's lawyers and, or, or housewives or students who say, I want to be a part of this, this revolution to create change in the world. That's incredibly inspiring. And so to that to to be living for a cause and a cause and a discipline of nonviolence that was a flame brought from India through Gandhi who was able to 
change India, you know, what had been attempted for 300 years, he did in his lifetime. All of these people who are saying, I believe in this cause, they have to change themselves. And leadership means what? As every parent knows, your child is going to clone you. They're going to mimic the way you handle situations. So no matter what you profess, no matter what you say to them in words, it's how you live and who you are that they're going to emulate. And so the leader has to be so clear because why? The leader has worked on his or herself first so that you can say, yes, there is character and honor here. I will follow you. Character, the bottom line. Same thing you're looking for in artists. And so having that example growing up created a criterion for how to live life, what kind of choices to make, and not that that's always been successful, but there has been in my brain immediately, your life is not your own. It's not just for you. It's, for, it's to help. And where you are is because of others. So there's a lot to give back. We have work to do. I think, again, in leadership, where are you leading people? <laughs> are you leading people off a cliff? And so leadership has to be, what is the goal for the common good? What is the, what is the aim of the human being? Again, in all businesses, it may not be happening now in some places, but inevitably we're going to understand that we as a business have to help eliminate to some degree the three sufferings on planet Earth. In every business, we have to participate in eradicating the sufferings on planet Earth in business but it should also be in families and it should be in individuals. And so what are we leading? We should be leading people back to their true selves, whether it's the individual or whether it's an organization, because that's what they are. And most change doesn't happen in groups. It happens in individuals. And so... If we were, as we were talking about earlier, if you recognize something in someone else that you think is harmful and in error, you first must eradicate any stain, any fragrance of that within yourself. And that's work. And that's transformation. And it's one less scoundrel in the world because you worked on yourself. And so again, I, I, I can't get away from the idea that leadership is self-reform. Is, is self that, that has to be part of it. It has to be. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you.